hello um, and welcome to the uh, the ongoing, I suppose, what should be called the IHR Earlier Middle Ages Seminar at Home um, edition. Um, we're very pleased to see people um, continuing to, uh, to tune in on Zoom. Uh, my name is Conor O'Brien and I'll be chairing um, today's seminar. Um, very pleased um, to have um, another um, guest who, uh, who couldn't be with us um, if, if we weren't in this uh, format, um, Celia Chazelle of the College of New Jersey. Um, now Celia is um, someone who um, I suppose for a long time has been um, writing and thinking about um, early medieval theology, early medieval images, the relationship between them. Um, much of her early work was on things like the Opus Caroli, um, fantastic book on the crucified Christ um, in the Carolingian era, before turning um, northwards to, to, to the Anglo-Saxon world um, with some great work on the Codex Amiatinus um, that culminated in, in a tome recently, almost as large as the Codex Amiatinus itself, um, about um, that great Bible and the sister manuscripts produced at Wearmouth Jarrow. Um, and I think um, today's um, paper will kind of speak to that um, and some of the research um, related to that. Um, but at the moment, um, Celia is already beginning a new book project, um, which she'll be working on next year when she's at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton, um, where she's interested in um, Gregory the Great and the story of, of slave boys in the market and how it was being retold and changed over the years. And I think some first work um, coming out of that um, will be appearing in Traditio later this year. Um, but for now, um, we're sticking with um, Wearmouth Jarrow. Um, I should just say um, before we get started that chat is, is disabled um, at the moment. I believe that will be re-enabled at, uh, at the end of the talk um, so that you can indicate if you have a question um, on Celia's paper then. Um, but for now, um, I'd just like to hand over to Celia um, and ask her to talk to us about Bede's Capitula Lectionum and the oriented reading of scripture at Wearmouth Jarrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, uh, Connor. Let me uh, try to share my screen and please let me know uh, whether it still works. <clears throat> Can you all see that? Okay, great. Um, and I want to stress at the start that this is work in progress. So I really welcome uh, feedback and um, you know, suggestions for other further research or, or whatever, I, uh, it would be very helpful. So thank you in advance. Um, okay, so let me uh, get started. Among Bede's writings identified at the close of his ecclesiastical history, completed about 731, are Capitula Lectionum, that is prefatory lists of headings or summaries of biblical chapters, like those for the book of Exodus uh, on this slide. The passage in the ecclesiastical history reveals that Bede composed such texts for much of the Old Testament um, and all the New Testament except the Gospels. Some of his capitula or capitularies, as the lists are also called, have long been known since they preface his commentaries on the same scripture. The majority were lost to scholarly view, however, until Paul Myvart demonstrated in 1995, primarily through stylistic analyses, that Bede was the probable author of six anonymous capitula lists in the Vulgate Full Bible known as the Codex Amiatinus, and the likely author of many other such lists compiled from medieval biblical codices by Donatian de Brun in the early 20th century to assist preparations of the Vulgate critical edition. Although Myvart's groundbreaking article appeared over 25 years ago, Bede's capitula have attracted only occasional scholarly attention since then, usually as a secondary concern in studies of his commentaries. The capitula are certainly less significant compositions, and this was apparently also his opinion. The passage in the ecclesiastical history omits some of the capitularies that Myvart located while those that are included receive merely brief notice in groups interspersed among more careful descriptions of the exegetical treatises. Nonetheless, it is notable that Bede chose to recall his capitula lists at all and as a distinct writing genre. One group recorded in the M text of the history but not the C text probably represents an interpolation made by his brethren after he died. 
They too appreciated his capitularies and wanted the listing as complete as possible. Maivart estimated that all told, Bede must have composed approximately 1400 individual capitula of scripture. Since each capitulum consists of at most a few sentences and sometimes only a single phrase or sentence, entire capitula lists or capitularies are never long. Yet writing so many individual summaries must have required significant effort. Given the number involved in the recording of them in the ecclesiastical history, it seems worthwhile to consider beyond Myvert's analysis, the possible motivations and aims behind this work. By analyzing Bede's capitularies alongside the existing evidence, albeit limited, of the circumstances in which he composed them, it may be possible to shed some new light on the strategies by which he sought to guide fellow readers in their own studies of scripture. In what follows, I first offer some brief general observations about ancient and medieval Latin biblical capitula, Bede's known work in this genre, and its relation to his writing of commentaries. Next, as initial case studies, I compare his capitularies of Acts and the Catholic epistles with the capitula prefacing the same scripture in the Codex Amiatinus and with aspects of his exegesis of those biblical books. <clears throat> Amiatinus, which was sent from Wormuth Gerald to Rome in 716 and is now in Florence, contains prefatory capitularies for most sections of its scripture. Except in the case of the Gospels, the Amiatinus lists are the only ones we can be confident were known at Wormuth Gerald besides the lists by Bede not copied into that Bible. Although Amiatinus left the monastery in 716, most of its capitula, like its scripture, were based on older biblical codices that Bede still consulted in later years. The Amiatinus exemplars are largely lost, yet their capitula are as preserved in the Codex Amiatinus, provide useful comparanda for illuminating characteristics of his capitularies and exploring why he chose to write them. I then turn to Bede's commentary on the Son of Sons. Amiatinus contains no original chapter divisions or capitulary for the Son, and none is apparently found in other early medieval scriptural codices. In this respect, the Son is similar to the Psalter and Book of Ruth, which also seem to have been transmitted without capitularies or chapter divisions until the later Middle Ages. But Amiatinus does follow the tradition of embedding Christological rubrics in the Son text. Bede's commentary on the Son has three prefatory sections. One, a first or preliminary book, that attacks writings attributed to the fifth century Pelagian bishop, Julian of Aclanum, two, a capitulary, and three, a seemingly amended version of Amiantinus's Son recension with modified rubrics. I will say a bit about Julian's attack on Juli uh, Bede's attack on Julian, but my larger concern is to explore how Bede's capitula, as well as the rubrics of his redaction of the Son, conform with his exegesis in the commentary and the significance of that relationship. For the most part, Bede's commentaries follow the Amiatinus biblical recensions. Yet as in his Son commentary, so in other exegetical treatises, he at times incorporated scriptural readings from other sources, some of which he clearly regarded as more accurate. As Richard Marsden speculated, Bede may have amended the Amiatinus exemplars while working on his commentaries. In the case of both the Son of Sons and Apocalypse, he evidently arranged for his revised versions of the scripture to be copied in full. With Bede in short, writing exegesis, composing new capitularies, and amending the Amiatinus recension as he deemed necessary, were apparently all facets of a coordinated endeavor to orient other readers' engagement with scripture along what he considered to be correct interpretive paths. Until the modern system of dividing Christian scripture into chapters and verses uh, began to prevail in the 13th century, and a, a wide array, array of division systems was employed throughout Latin Europe. Different biblical manuscripts present the same scripture broken into disparate numbers of chapters with different beginning and end points. Many, though not all such manuscripts include prefatory capitularies listing numbered headings or summaries of the chapters the text that I also identify here as capitula. The numeration is repeated at the appropriate points in the biblical text. 
Michael Gorman suggested that new division systems and capitularies may have typically been prepared as biblical books were amended. But manuscripts containing earlier capitular lists and chapter divisions continued to be used and copied. Adding to the diversity, older capitularies and division systems could be modified as they were transmitted. Sorry. The Codex Fuldensis, for example, a sixth century Italian New Testament has anti-Pelagian capitula for the first part of the epistle to the Romans, but sometime during their transmission, those summaries were joined to a different series for the rest of Romans. The Fuldensis capitulary has 51 headings for 51 chapters of Romans. According to De Bruyne, British Library Royal 1E8 has partly the same capitulary with 52 entries, and the 11th century Staflo Bible has another version with 62 entries. A further issue is that capitula were at times copied with biblical recensions besides those for which they were first crafted. For this and other reasons, one system might be reflected in the chapter divisions of the scripture and a different system in the prefatory capitula. The Fuldensis capitulary and text of Romans exemplify this problem as well. In principle though, like canon tables prefacing gospel books, capitularies were important paratexts for mediating readers' interaction with scripture visually as well as, uh, as, well as textually. Sorry, I just have to figure out how to advance this. Okay, good. The lists in the Codex Amiatinus, for example, are laid out in two columns like its scripture, but they are distinguished by their slightly smaller unseal, the indentation of the entries, and the numeration written in red ink in the margins. The Utrecht Gospel Fragment, another Wilmoth Gerald uh, manuscript, and the Burchard Gospels, a sixth century Italian codex with Wilmoth Gerald provenance, contain lists with similar attributes. Such clear mise en page facilitated the efforts of clergy to locate chapters to read as mass pericopes. Amiatinus' Capitula of Luke and John reveal this intended purpose through rubrics copied next to four summaries. The rubrics identify those chapters as gospel paracopes for Easter, Lent, commemoration of the dead, and masses at any time. For the continuous reading of scripture besides the gospels, that was probably Wormuth Gerald practice in the night office, capitularies and chapter numbers helped lectors determine where to begin and end the biblical sections read each night. Capitularies and chapter divisions aided religious and clergy to find discrete biblical passages for their non-liturgical reading as well. But additionally, the prefatory capitula offered an introduction to the scripture and an interpretive guide. To judge from de Bruyne's compilation, many medieval biblical capitula consist of short headings or highly abbreviated summaries of the scripture with sometimes idiosyncratic grammar or syntax. The capitula primarily referred to the scripture's literal or historical content. Allusions to figurative interpretation seem rare. Nonetheless, even lists consisting of very brief and literal synopses can represent the scripture according to a particular hermeneutic. The, chap the choice is made as to which biblical episodes or themes to recall in a capitulary, which to pass over in silence, what details to include, these and other decisions might well influence how readers understood the accompanying biblical text. As they proceeded from study of the capitula to the scripture or the reverse, or back and forth between them, those interwoven experiences could further shape responses to both. Bede wrote capitula of the following sections, uh, biblical sections and books, Genesis through Judges, Kings and Chronicles, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Son of Sons, Isaiah, Ezekiel, part of Jeremiah, the Minor Prophets, Job, Judith, Esther, Tobias, Ezra, Nehemiah, for which he wrote two lists, and as I mentioned earlier, the entire New Testament except the Gospels. His list for one Samuel, that is one Kings, and Son of Sons, and one list for Ezra Nehemiah circulated as prefaces to his commentaries on those texts. His lists for Exodus through Judges were copied into Amiatinus and some Carolingian and post-Carolingian Bibles. None of Bede's other lists is in Amiatinus, but they show up in biblical manuscripts of the ninth and later centuries. 
His treatises on the tabernacle and temple are prefaced by capitularies that Myvert did not discuss with headings for the related sections of Exodus and Three Kings. Bede's biblical capitula generally share three broad traits that are usefully outlined here. First, as was apparently the norm in this textual genre, majority <laughs> the majority summarize the scripture's literal or historical sense. Even his lists for Old Testament histories on which he wrote largely figurative commentaries, such as 1 Samuel and Ezra's Nehemiahs, are predominantly or entirely historical in orientation. As much scholarship on Bede has remarked, his allegorical exegetical treatises typically include some discussion of the scripture's literal meaning or historical context, the circumstances in which a biblical book was written, the etymology of words, the chronology and locations of events, and so forth. Relative to his commentaries, however, his capitula are exceptionally focused on the letter of scripture. Second, as Myvart observed, compared with other medieval capitularies, those by Bede are often quite detailed and his summaries tend to be carefully worded. The list prefacing his treatises on the tabernacle and temple are unusual in these respects, since most of their entries are only short titles. Occasional summaries and other lists by Bede are similarly abbreviated and simply note isolated topics in the scripture. More frequently though, he composed his summaries in sentences with varying structures and transitions between entries that give the sequence a certain eloquence and coherence. Although he often divided biblical books into fewer chapters than in Amiatinus, he took care to summarize longer chapters in some detail. Usually his lists provide enough information for readers to gain a basic sense of the biblical content from the capitula alone, whether or not the scripture was read. Those of his lists that I have closely surveyed also suggest an effort to divide the scripture at logical narrative or thematic breaks so that chapters conclude with the resolution of their ac action or theme. This may be a sign that when deciding where to place the divisions, he was mindful of liturgical reading. Churches or monasteries that adhere, adhere to his division systems face little risk, it seems, of ending a pericope or the lections of the night office with a cliffhanger, a sense that a narrative episode or theme remained unresolved. Third, although most of Bede's capitula review the scripture's literal or historical content, is an interest in allegorical exegesis sometimes emerges. His capitula of Job echo Christological refrains of Gregory's Moralia in Job, which Bede used as a source. His capitula of Apocalypse, like his Apocalypse commentary, are attentive to the scripture's literal prophecy of the end times, yet emphasize symbolic readings that link John's vision with the history of the church. As I would discuss shortly, Bede's capitula of Acts and the Catholic epistles, some almost exclusively refer to his literal sense but in ways that correlate with moral and ecclesiological refrain in his commentaries on those texts. His capitulary of the Son of Son center entirely on the figurative interpretations set out in his commentary on the poem. In sum, while his summaries largely stay within traditional parameters for the genre, many are noticeably sophisticated examples that seem to refine and expand the range of possible approaches to the design of such lists in terms of both style and content. In the preface of his Apocalypse commentary finished about 703, Bede recalls an already completed libellus comprising his capitula and the book of Apocalypse. The same chapter divisions were placed in the commentary, his preface notes, to facilitate study of his Apocalypse capitula and the scripture with his exegesis. The libellus is lost, but comparison of the Amiatinus recension of Apocalypse with the commentary Lamada, that is the passages from Apocalypse which Bede quotes then interprets, have shown that the libellus likely contained a revision of the Amiatinus recension. The thematic analogies between Bede's capitula of Acts and the first of his two commentaries on Acts, the Expositio, which he finished about 710, suggests that they may have similarly been roughly contemporaneous productions. As with Apocalypse, differences between the Amiatinus text of Acts and the Lamada of Bede's Expositio 
are possible clues that he revised the biblical exemplar or commissioned an amended copy around the time that he wrote his exegesis and possibly his capitula. Amiatinus's um, capitulary of Acts elucidates why Bede saw it as necessary to compose a new one. Amiatinus is the only known surviving witness of its Acts capitulary, which was most likely copied from the same exemplar as its text of Acts. I show here the capitulary's opening 11 of a total of 70 summaries with modern chapters and verses noted to clarify where Amiatinus's chapter divisions fall. As is common in early medieval biblical capitularies, many entries in the Amiatinus list are fairly brief headings that open with ubi, where. Many only review part of the action narrated in the biblical chapter with the result that sequences of capitula can seem to jump abruptly from one topic to the next. The included information is often condensed with important events ignored, such as for instance, the ascension, an event within the scope of the first capitulum shown here, but, but omitted. The outcome of events that are reported is also sometimes omitted. For example, while Amiantinus's uh, capitulum nine on this slide refers to the incarceration of Peter and John, there is no mention of the council held the next day to hear their case, the context in which people wondered at their illiteracy as recalled in Capitulum 10. Bede's Capitulary uh, uh, divides Acts into 63 chapters. I note his first eight summaries in two slides. Like the 70 Amiatinus Capitula of Acts, his summaries concentrate on the scripture's literal sense. As the different numbers of capitula in these two lists reveal, however, Bede's chapters are often, though not invariably, longer than those of Amiatinus. The first 11 Amiatinus capitula cover the same scripture as the first eight in Bede's list to Acts, uh, modern Acts uh, 4, uh, verse 31. Even when chapter lengths are comparable, Bede's summaries usually seem to encompass more of each chapter's narrative development. Key events omitted from the Amiatinus list are reported. The ascension is reported in his first capitulum. Uh, the first reference to Christians in Antioch, uh, also ignored in the Amiatinus capitulary, is mentioned in his uh, 25th capitulum. In capitulum six, where he needed to summarize an especially long unit of scripture, he worked to convey the full narrative scope by recalling events at both the start and the end of the passage. The opening of the next capitulum, seven, is indicative of his effort to create a sense of narrative coherence by smoothing transitions between summaries. Note too how he occasionally included non-biblical information to clarify obscure details of the scripture such as, such as his explanation in Capitulum 42 that Kencrie is a port of Corinth, a fact not mentioned in the text of Acts. Bede's Acts Capitulary also exemplifies his tendency to place chapter breaks where they would not interrupt actions or themes. To illustrate, we may compare Amiatinus' chapters 32 and 33 with Bede's chapters 26 and 27. As the summaries indicate, Amiatinus's 32nd chapter encompasses the account of Agabus' prophecy of famine through Peter's imprisonment at Herod's command. The story of Peter's release by an angel falls in the next chapter, 33. Chapter 26 in Bede's division of the scripture covers only the prophecy of Agabus and the ensuing journey of Barnabas and Saul with alms. References to James's death then Peter's incarceration open chapter 27 but that chapter continues through the story of Peter's release and visit to John Mark's mother. Here too, the narrative action is resolved within the chapter. Bede's Capitulum 28 on the same slide recalls Herod's death, another event ignored in the Amiatinus Capitulary and closes with the claim that the king's demise freed the way for apostolic preaching. That assertion does not directly conform to the letter of the scripture but it points to a broad refrain in Acts emphasized throughout Bede's list. The church's steady growth as the apostles evangelized and baptized Gentiles along with Jews, drawing them into a single community. 
His two treatises on acts developed this theme through their interplay of historical and allegorizing, uh, allegorizing exegesis. In his capitulary, as in the entry shown here, he highlights the theme by including much more information about the apostles preaching, teaching, and other acts of ministry than does Amiatinus's capitulary. Yet while B's capitula are more informative than those in Amiatinus about most aspects of the Acts text, his list has certain noteworthy omissions. At least some of the silences appear to be strategic. Let me close discussion of this list with two examples. The first concerns his neglect of the description in modern Acts 4 verse 13 of Peter and John as illiterate and unlearned, the main topic of Amiatinus's 10th entry. That report falls within the narrative boundaries of Bede's seventh capitulum. His summary ignores the report, possibly because it conflicted with his interest in representing the apostles as models for contemporary educated monks and clergy to emulate. His expositio links this passage in Acts with the apostles' new empowerment by the spirit 18 verses later, an event that Bede does recall in capitulum eight. As he explains in the expositio, the gift of the spirit affirmed that divine power, not human learning, inspired their preaching. The second example comes from, concerns his capitulum 29, which recalls the blinding of the magician Elamas. Here omits the name bar Yesu, given for the same person a few verses earlier in Acts. bar Yesu is the only name reported in Amiatinus's corresponding summary. In the Expositio, Bede argues that this passage in Acts is corrupt since bar Yesu means son of Jesus. It cannot be a magician's name. The correct rendering is Beriu, he asserts. The lemma in the Retractio, Bede's second treatise on Acts, simply gives the name as Beriu with no explanation. This may indicate that by the time the Retractio was written in the later 720s, the exemplar used for Amiatinus's Acts and consulted for the Expositio had been revised or an amended copy made. The name Son of Jesus had essentially disappeared from the version of Acts read at Wormuth Gerald. Bede's capitula of the Catholic epistles can be more, compar uh, more briefly compared with the Amiatinus list. As in his commentaries on Apocalypse and Acts, numerous lamada of his exegetical tracts on the seven epistles diverge from the Amiatinus recension. And I owe this information to the great work of a research assistant, Andrew Holland. Here again, Bede possibly amended the Amiatinus exemplars around the time that he prepared his commentaries. The latter texts were probably finished by 716. Writing the capitula may to some extent have coincided with that work. This slide shows the first three summaries of James from Amiatinus and Bede's lists. Both capitularies remain close to the scripture's literal sense. Since the Catholic epistles have much to say about moral and doctrinal matters, both lists echo those refrains in summarizing the epistles. Yet these capitula are noticeably more lucid and detailed. Compare, for example, the first capitulum of James in each list. Amiatinus is somewhat obscure concerning the attacks of the enemies of joy that must be pruned away versus Bede's entry Writing to Jews throughout the world, James teaches that they must rejoice in temptations, not emulate the glory of riches, since the love of riches is death, but patience awaits the crown. Uh, Amiatinus's capitula of 2 Peter through Jude come from a different source than that Bible's lists for James in 1 Peter, and they are relatively more informative but they also do not compare in clarity or precision with the majority of Bede's capitula for the same letters. I present the opening summaries of 2 Peter to illustrate. It is possible to imagine readers employing Bede's series as a meditational aid on its own, independently of the reading of the epistle. Like his first two capitula of 2 Peter shown here, his summaries of all seven epistles regularly call attention to moral and doctrinal themes of the of of the scripture that are emphasized in his commentaries, and the capitula used similar language. His first capitulum of 1 John resonates with the Christological exegesis in Augustine's uh, Tractatus on 1 John, 
from which Bede borrowed extensively in his own treatise on the letter. His second entry in the same list and other summaries in his lists for the, other, for the Catholic epistles cast doctrinal and moral lesson, uh, lessons in terms that, as in his commentaries, underscore the lesson's relevance to his present. Note, for instance, the contrast between Amiantinus's second and fourth capitula of James and Bede's capitula two and three, which echo the letter's first person locutions. James's admonitions seem explicitly directed in the capitulary to Bede and his readers. On the other hand, biblical passages inviting eschatological interpretations are ignored or toned down as in his commentaries probably because he worried about apocalypse-liptic sentiments among his peers. Compare the fifth entry of his list for one John with Amiatinus's Capitulum 7. Like his commentaries too, his Capitula of the Seven Epistles frequently describe enemies of the church as heretics, a term resonating with Bede's contemporary concerns. The epistles themselves are more likely to identify the adversaries as false teachers, unbelievers, or pseudo prophets. I will now shift to Bede's treatise on the Song of Songs. As Arthur Holder has demonstrated, this commentary was, was also probably completed by 716. As I noted earlier, Amiatinus' text of the Song lacks original chapter divisions or a capitulary. Bede's capitular list for the Son appears to have only circulated as part of his commentary's prefatory matter. Its other texts included, as mentioned earlier, a book attacking the Pelagian Julian of Aclanum and a seemingly amended version of Amiatinus's recension of the Son with altered rubrics. Bede's commentary itself contains five books of his exegesis and a sixth book of exegetical excerpts from writings by Gregory the Great. In the modern critical edition by David Hurst, and in three of the four 9th to 11th century manuscripts that I have been able to check, including the codex shown here, Bede's capitulary appears between the book against Julian and the Son text. In most of the manuscripts, chapter numbers are repeated with the Son, but not the commentary, as in this manuscript. Uh, here is a copy where uh, the numbers are not repeated and I'm sorry that it's in black and white. <clears throat> Thematic and topical interconnections, however, suggest that Bede's work on his capitula, rubrics, and revisions of the scripture was probably more or less contemporaneous with the writing of his exegesis. It is, let me go back here. It is best to begin with book, uh, Bede's book against Julian. This opening section attacks three texts ascribed to the fifth century bishop, two genuinely by him a two book treatise on love titled De Amora and a tract on perseverance called De Bona Constantiae. Both treatises are lost aside from the few passages that B quotes. The third text attributed to Julian is Pelagius's letter to Demetrius. Bede implies that monks in his milieu who thought Jerome had written the letter were receptive to the teachings set out in all three works. As far as can be discerned from Bede's discussion, the second book of De Amora was devoted to exegesis of the Son that conformed to Julian's doctrine of the goodness of marital procreation. By Bede's day, the convention of reading the Son of Sons as an allegory of divine human relations was firmly established in Christian exegesis. As in the rubric seen here, um, yeah, good, I've got the right slide. As in the rubric seen here, the bridegroom was understood as a figure of Christ or God, while interpretations of the bride were more diverse. Origen had wavered between identifying her with the church and the faithful soul. Although the notion that she personified the church prevailed in late, late antique Latin writings, they expressed varied beliefs about the uh, church's precise nature as a metaphorical female body. Jovinian drew on the song to support his doctrine that within the church, Married Christians and the chase held equal status. Other theologians found support in the poem for conceptions of the church as hierarchically ordered with virgins at the top. For Ambrose who also valued chastity, the son's bride was a figure of the church, holy souls and virgins, especially Mary. The paucity of extant fragments of Julian's De Amora makes it impossible to determine, to determine much about his reading of the song 
Yet all four passages discussed by Bede seem to have presented allegorical interpretations. One quoted passage clearly interprets the Psalms bridegroom as Christ. Another excerpt is too short to be certain of the exact meaning, but may indicate that Julian understood the bride partly as a figure of the soul striving for salvation. As Bede's broader discussion reveals, Julian believed that salvation depended on freely willed virtue. Like Pelagius, the bishop thought that human nature still possessed innate goodness after the fall. Holy love is present in every soul from birth, Bede claims that Julian taught. Accordingly, whereas Augustine held that the fall tainted all sexual love, Julian drew the distinction between temporal marital procreation and fornication. Human love, he apparently argued, was sinful insofar as it came from the body, but good to the degree, degree that it derived from the soul. Sins such as lust resulted from bad habits that each per person could and should work to overcome. Divine grace assisted those efforts, but the first move toward virtue and discipline in its pursuit were possible before grace was received. Pelagius's letter to Demetrius presents analogous lines of thought. Two passages quoted by Bede point to the good attributes of ancient philosophers and Old Testament saints like Job's, Job as proof that grace is not essential to virtue. Since the philosophers and Job lived before the incarnation, and therefore the passages imply, before grace was available, they must have achieved goodness on their own. Bede's refutation of Julian is rooted in his own conviction that throughout history, Grace has been necessary to salvation. Although his doctrine of grace deviates in certain respects from that of Augustine, Bede follows the Bishop of Hippo and even more closely Gregory the Great in holding that any genuine growth in faith and virtue requires the divine gift. Sin is congenital, Bede insists, and therefore only when grace is present can the soul truly love God, the highest form of love. Neither pagan philosophers nor Job could possess a taste of wisdom or virtue without grace, Bede asserts against the letter to Demetrius. Bede's commentary on the Song of Songs aligns with this doctrine. Occasionally he alludes to older texts presenting song exegesis that troubled him besides Julian's De Amora, such as Tychonius's Book of Rules and possibly Ambrose's treatise on virginity. Like those earlier authors, Bede consistently interprets the book poem allegorically both in his psalm commentary and in other writings that cite the poem or evoke its language. For him too, the bridegroom is always Christ or God. Although Bede sometimes links the bride with uh, the faithful soul, far more often he identifies her as the church. His short treatise on poetry, De Arta Metrica, alludes to a long-standing interpretive tradition when it describes the song as, quote, a dramatic or acted poem in which the voice of Christ is clearly found alternating with that of the church. A fundamental concept for Bede articulated in many of his writings, but with particular clarity in the, in the song commentary, is the church's existence before as well as since the incarnation. Ecclesial membership in his belief encompasses not only Christian, but also ancient Jewish uh, elect, all of whom are or will be redeemed through grace. The song commentary sometimes identifies the pre-incarnation church as the synagogue. Elsewhere, Bede uses the term ecclesia for both it and its post-incarnation form. The whole congregation of the elect in general is called the church, he explains in the prologue. Yet now the portion of the faithful which preceded the incarnation is specially called the synagogue and that which followed it the church. Grace is the key to salvation and therefore their union. As Bede states in relation to the Psalm's first verse, for just as we hope and believe that we will be saved by the Lord's incarnation, passion and resurrection, which have already been accomplished, so did the former part of the church, that is the synagogue, which expected the same incarnation, passion and resurrection, believe that she was going to be saved through the grace of him whose coming she desired. Since no one can be saved except through grace, Bede reaffirms in book five, the synagogue safeguarded the Jewish elect until Christ's birth. Apparently, he envisaged the incarnation, bestowing grace retroactively on the elect who died before that event. I will indicate other exegetical themes as I compare Bede's rubrics with those in, in Amiatinus, 
then discuss his capitula. His decision to preface his commentary with the complete song text as well as a capitulary appears to have been unprecedented. As with his commentary on Apocalypse, where he adopted an analogous approach, one motivation probably lay in his concern about heterodox interpretations. <clears throat> While Bede's exegesis mostly follows the Amiatinus recension of the song, there are again points at which his lamata diverge. And I don't have time to discuss this issue here, but just to mention that the commentary lamata seem a more accurate window on his redaction of the scripture than the text printed as a preface in her sedition. Most deviations between Bede's Lamada and the Amiatinus scripture are minor. Some may have resulted from him paraphrasing in his commentary. Yet occasionally his exegesis reveals that his alternate reading was deliberately chosen. One example is found at Psalm 8 verse 13 in modern chapter and verse. The, Amiaten text, the Amiatinus text reads, qui habitas in hortis, you male who dwell in the gardens. According to its rubric, the speaker is the church addressing Christ. The corresponding entry in Beat's capitulary, his rubric and his exegesis all depend on the ver version quae habitas. In all these texts, Bede interprets the speaker as Christ addressing the church, you female who dwell in the gardens. The table, tables on this and the next two slides present select rubrics from Amiantinus and Bede's series with the opening and closing words of each passage. The final rubric in the Bede column is my edition. It is not found in Hearst's edition or the manuscripts I've been able to consult, but both Bede's capitulary and his exegesis refer to the shift in speaker at this point. The psalm rubrics underwent some alterations as the commentary was transmitted. This one may have fallen out early in that process. As can be seen from the tables, there's much agreement between Amiatinus's and Bede's rubrics, understandably, since the song itself often clearly assigns speech to the bride or bridegroom. Where Bede departs from the Amiatinus rubrication, one evident factor was his concern for clarity. Amiatinus has no rubrics for the first three verses. Bede seems to have included two, numbers one to two on the list. For Psalm uh, 2, verse 15a, and Psalm 3, verse 10, that is in the modern division, Amiatinus has rubrics that do not name the speakers. Those are numbers 13 and 18. Bede makes plain that Psalm 2, verse 15a is spoken by Christ, and Psalm 3, 3 is part of a longer passage that he assigns to the church. But a more pervasive concern was to assure that all rubrics coincided with his interpretation of the scripture. Some Amiatinus rubrics are markedly at odds with how, he, with, with how he understood the dialogue to unfold. Friedrich Ohli has noted that Bede's treatise was the first since Origen's writings to define clearly the distribution of voices throughout the poem. Every exegetical unit identifies the same speaker or speakers as does the rubric and interprets the biblical text from that perspective. To note again, only a few examples. Bede's rubrics assigning the psalm's first two verses to the synagogue and the third verse to the church correlate with his exegesis of the passage as a celebration of the union between the church's two parts, thanks to their shared devotion to Christ and the gift of grace to both. His next rubric for Psalm 1, verse 4, number three on the slide, like his exegesis, identifies the speaker as the church. Here, Amiatinus has the old Latin variant, I am black and beautiful. The Amiatinus rubric identifies the speaker as the synagogue. Bede's version of the scripture is Vulgate, I am black but beautiful. His exegesis criticizes the erroneous belief of some people as he claims that the old Latin variant refers to false brethren mixing with spiritual brethren inside the church. Against this interpretation, Bede argues that the church is black not from sinners, but from trials and sufferings. The Amiatinus rubric for Psalm 3 verses 1 to 4, number 15 on the slide, follows an older convention of assigning the passage to Mary Magdalene. Bede's rubrics and commentary restrict the speakers of the entire Psalm dialogue to the church or synagogue and Christ. Psalm 3 verses 1 to 3a are therefore assigned in both Bede's rubric and his exegesis 
to the church elected from the Gentiles. The rest of the passage is assigned to the church speaking about Christ. In the commentary, Bede acknowledges the passage's traditional connection with the Magdalene, but explains that she was a type of the church. Accentuating, accentuating the bond thus forged between the Son text and the commentary are passages in the latter that are worded as continuations of the poem's dialogue, but cast allegorically. The invented speeches are assigned to the same interlocutors identified in the rubrics, Christ, the church, the synagogue. Scott de Gregorio and Rosalind Love have aptly, aptly described this technique, which Bede also employed in his, in his commentary on 1 Samuel as impersonation exegesis. In both of his commentaries, the invented discourse articulates key exegetical themes. Beyond this, in the treatise on the Son, the imagined speeches impart some of the poem's dramatic impact to the commentary, while further binding the exegesis to the scripture copied directly beforehand. Bede's capitulary of the Son also reinforces the connection between the scripture and his interpretation. In this instance, as Anne Matter has observed, by summarizing the poem in a manner that presupposes its allegorical meaning. As I noted earlier, Bede's song capitulary is unusual, not only since early medieval editors of the poem normally did not divide it into chapters, but also since his capitula depart from the convention of primarily summarizing a biblical text, literal or historical sense. In part, his lack of attention to the song's literal meaning attests the weight of older allegorical interpretive traditions. The notion that the son mystically expresses the love between God and humanity was so embedded in Latin thought by the eighth century that his celebration of love between a mortal bride and bridegroom was essentially lost from view. The allegorical meaning had become the scripture's literal truth. In addition though, Bede's allegorical capitulary reflects the further older concept attested in the son rubrics of the poem as an acted drama. His summaries meet, read much like the scenario of a play. Relative to his commentary, the capitula sharpened the focus on the poem's own dramatic structure. Yet they move beyond the poetry by clarifying how the conversation between Christ, the church, and the synagogue transpires in Christian time. As both the capitula and the commentary demonstrate, the course of ecclesial history is itself a mystical theme of that dialogue. The first, uh, the first capitulum links the son's first verse with the synagogue before the incarnation. According to the second and third capitula, the conversation then shifts to the troubles of the primitive church. Toward the end of the capitulary, summaries 27 through 29 refer to the battles at the end of time and possibly the final conversion of Jews. Intermediary capitula center on the church's relationship with Christ in the present age. As described in the summaries, their conversation touches on the gift of divine grace, number three, Christ's life, passion, and resurrection, number four, the need to fight heresy, uh, number nine, and the value of preaching, prayer, and ascetic discipline, numbers nine, 11, 12, among other topics. In Capitulum 33, for the passage beginning at Psalm uh, 7, verse 13, all fruits, new and beloved, all fruits new and old, my beloved, I kept kept for you, Bede adopts the interpretive device of recapitulation used in his Apocalypse Capitula and commentary. Beginning from a new beginning, he states, the church wishes for the Lord to become incarnate. We have returned to the era of the synagogue. In the remaining Capitula, the church's conversation with Christ centers on the needs of the primitive church, the membership in it of Gentiles with believing Jews, and the importance of preaching and teaching to the church's spiritual prosperity. Let me conclude, and I thought we needed a bit of color. That's the reason for the picture. Um, although Bede implied in his ecclesiastical history that his commentaries were more important writings, his impressive output of biblical capitula allows little doubt that he recognized their value. In the liturgy, capitularies would not have been read themselves, but by indicating where chapter breaks fell and the chapter topics, they assisted religious and clergy to locate suitable, suitable pericopes for masses and to organize the night office readings. 
Outside the liturgy, the headings or summaries, no, more, no matter how perfunctory, offered readers a distinctive overview of the biblical contents. Whether readers moved back and forth between a capitulary and different parts of the scripture, or read a list in full before turning to the scripture or an exegetical tract, the capitula invited notice of certain topics or refrains and potentially shaped how they were understood while encouraging neglect of other elements. Bede's capitula lists reveal his skills with this textural genre. Often his lists indicate that he thought carefully about where to divide the scripture in order to avoid disrupting episodes or themes. His summaries are often both lucid and detailed. Although the majority recall the scripture's literal content, he was adept at shaping them at any, interp at any interpretive level to correlate with his exegetical interests. Some of this effort, both with the lists examined here and others, likely occurred in the same broad time frame as his preparation of commentaries. At least some of that work seems to have also coincided more or less closely with the production of amended versions of the Amiatina scripture. His endeavor to orient readers towards scripture in ways that conformed with his knowledge of the Bible and interpretation of its meaning was thus multifaceted. His commentary on the Son of Psalms illumines this quality especially well. Its prefatory capitulary was composed alongside modifications of the poem's rubrics, as well as some changes to the Amiatinus recension. And both the capitulary and rubrics were worded to align with Bede's figurative exegesis in his commentary. Modern historians of biblical exegesis have extensively analyzed Bede's commentaries, homilies, and exegetical letters. Much work remains to be done on those writings, of course, Yet I hope that the case studies examined here have shown how closer attention to paratexts like his capitularies may also provide new insights into his strategies and techniques of biblical scholarship. Such seemingly minor compositions were important enough for him to dedicate significant time to crafting them and often with a notable degree of care. They should therefore be important to us. Thank you.